Do you want me to start sharing the screen? Sure, go ahead. Thank you, Ramon. Welcome everyone. Um, as usual, we like to give everyone time to come in and get situated and then we'll get started. Welcome everyone, happy Friday. Come on in and have a seat, get situated and we'll get started shortly. Hi, everyone. We're going to wait just a moment, another moment or two, uh, and then we'll go ahead and get started. We have a lot of material to cover, so we don't want to wait too long. Okay, everyone, welcome. Um, it is, uh, I have about two after. Uh, happy Friday. Um, we, we are thrilled that Imon Kwome is here to uh, present uh, the introduction to programming for the All of Us uh, work, uh, Researcher Workbench. Uh, she has a lot of information to share. So um, I'll go ahead and get started uh, with just our quick housekeeping items. Um, Amon, if you want to go ahead and move, just to refresh everyone's memory, uh, the session is being recorded. The slides and the recording will be sent to everyone who has registered. Please use that Q&A uh, option for questions, um, and questions will be answered when the presentation is complete. We'll get to many, as many questions as possible, and of course, please fill out our su survey after today's session. Um, just as a quick refresher, um, you can view all the questions on your own. You can upvote questions. You can make comments on questions. Uh, you can submit a new question. And you can use a thumbs up or an icon to upvote questions. Um, <clears throat> and of course, upvote voting makes it easier for us uh, to know what questions participants are most interested in, in viewing. Um, and just a few highlights about the NIH library and the services that uh, we provide here. Um, <clears throat> we have our bibliometric service, which provides publication analysis to staff. We also provide access to, <clears throat> excuse me, bioinforma bioinformatics analysis tools um, and databases and related training. And then in data services, we provide information on data management, data visualization, data analysis, and coding languages like R and Python. Um, if you want more information, there's our uh, uh, 
visit our training website or you can contact me directly. Um, just a few highlights of upcoming training. Uh, here are a few uh, calendar events. Uh, we have uh, creating pivot tables next week and then several May events uh, are in our studio uh, next month as well as several data science classes, data wrangling, data science using MATLAB, et cetera. Um, so now it is my uh, pleasure to uh, introduce Amon Kwame. Uh, she's a data scientist at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. She leads the data science and engineering effort for digital, digital health technologies, think Fitbit. Um, she's involved in the back end and front end processes of the All of Us Researcher Workbench um, Curated Data Repository. She works closely with the curation and the research support teams. Um, Amon discovered her passion for data science after working a few years in business and accounting. Uh, she holds a master's degree in science and data analytics, information systems, and accounting and business management. And before uh, at Vanderbilt, she worked on data, a data science team in the sci cybersecurity industry. So, Imon, welcome, and thank you for being here today. Thank you so much, Cindy. Um, well, welcome, everyone. Um, so today, I'm going to take you into programming within the researcher workbench. Um, so last week, you had a great overview of how to use the core builder and data set builder to get the data that you need. So today, I'm going to take you to the next step of the analysis, which is once you have your data, how do you start manipulating it with R. Um, so in order to do that, we're going to need to show rule level data, but any rule level data that you see today will not be real participant data. It will be synthetic data. I just want to show you the before and after for some of the wrangling um, processes. So any count and summary statistics that you see do not represent the real data. The schema of the data, meaning the name of the columns and name of the tables, will be the same as the real data, but the data itself is synthetic. So here's the agenda. We'll go through um, the analysis process, um, general analysis steps that goes for any analysis really. So we'll go from data collection to data visualization. Um, and I will also show you, you know, how you can save your data in the bucket or the persistent disk. Um, if you have time, I will explain the process. If not, I will show you just a snippet that is already available for you within the researcher workbench. And we'll do all of that within our studio. So you do have three options to run your analysis. You have Jupyter Notebook, R Studio, or SAS Studio. And today we'll focus on R Studio, but I will show you a little bit of code, what it looks like in Jupyter Notebook in R and Python. Um, many researchers think um, sometimes that you can actually run your analysis in the cohort builder or data set builder. You cannot do that. These are just for you to select your population and the data that you want. But what you actually manipulate the data is within Jupyter Notebook, R Studio, or SAS Studio. Um, today we will not cover SAS Studio, but we do have an upcoming office hour on May 24th, and you're welcome to join. We also have already released a feature workspace on SAS, um, so you will need to log in with your researcher account to access that one. And then we have research hub articles. Um, I invite you to come to tomorrow's webinar because we're going to dive deeper into the resources available for you within the res uh, research workbench. All right, now I want to stop sharing my screen and share uh, my stable environment, which hosts the synthetic data. All right. And, all right, everyone should be able to see the screen. Um, so this is the th synthetic environment um, and it is um, pretty much similar, very similar to the real All of Us Research Workbench. Um, and if you created a workspace, if you open a workspace, it looks something like this with all your notebooks or our markdown files. And these are your three environments that you have as option. And you, you will need you know, to create an environment first if you haven't already. And when it's done run, 
creating like for our studio, it will show a green screen and you can click open and then you will go, this is what the R studio interface looks like. But um, this is what Jupyter Notebooks looks like. So this is just one of those that I created for you to see. So this is the basic code. When you copy paste your code or import it from the data set builder into the notebook, and I believe that's where Dr. Lyon stopped yesterday, uh, last week. Um, so the code looks like this, and you do need to click on here and run it to be able to get the data and start working with it, right? But when you first open the notebook, um, this is in Python, and this one is R. When you first open the notebook, um, you will get something like this. You need to actually click edit um, to be able to run it. You can do, you cannot save your data um, in playground mode. You can run it, but anything that you do will not be saved. Now, quickly before we go to our studio, um, let me explain what this is in general so that you know some of the dots can be connected for you. This here um, is a SQL query. So whenever you were clicking on your options in the cohort builder, in data set builder, choosing your cohort, choosing your concept set and all of that, a SQL query was being constructed in the background for you because the CDR, which is the data set available to researchers, is um, living on a BigQuery database. And the only language that BigQuery understands is SQL. So we have to use SQL to get data from there. That is a data collection process. But because we still want to work in R or Python, we need a way for R and Python to talk to one another, let's say. Um, so that's why we have to wrap this code in a Python or R code. And we use libraries like Big R Query to help us do that. And then we get a R data frame. Okay, so that's kind of an overview. And Jupyter Notebook um, is pretty intuitive. To run a code, you just click here and run, and then you will start working with your data. Okay, now let's go to RStudio. Once I open RStudio, this is what I get. Um, and here I just copied pasted the code that I got from the data set builder right here. And again, I need to run this. And in order to run in RStudio, I simply click run. Now we're working in a .rmd file, so a markdown file, um, which allows us to have you know, code with text and subtitles and titles, which organizes our work nicely. You do have other file options in RStudio. You can create an R script, which is just plain R code, which can be useful in some cases, but if you're trying to run an analysis, a markdown is your best option. You, you can see that you can even write Python code in here. But to just to create a new file, you just click here, new file, and click on R Markdown, and then it'll give you the option to name your file, and then you can um, click OK and start your file. All right? So data collection, SQL. Now, you can have your SQL query um, constructed from, for you from the data set builder, or you can also write your own SQL query if you know SQL. If you don't know SQL, that's fine. You can just use the tools. Um, and you can do that in a Jupyter notebook as well. You can write your own SQL, and then you can merge um, the tables and the SQL from your own query with the SQL from the data set builder together. You can do all of that. So here, I'm not going to go through you know, all of how you write SQL, um, but I wrote a few queries here um, for later because we're gonna need that for some of the wrangling that I will show you. So this is just a simple query to get some demographics from the person table. Um, and this is a simple query to get demographics, to get data from the Fitbit heart rate summary table. And this is just some questions from the basic survey this is um, some data from the visit occurrence EHR table. This is um, data from um, cancer from the condition occurrence table. And then this is physical measurement data, specifically blood pressure, heart rate, hip and waist circumference. Okay, so 
As you saw earlier in my slides, the second step in the analysis process is after you've collected your data, you want to be able to understand it so that you can further analyze it and wrangle it. So you want like a visual of it and then a real sense of what is in your data. So the first thing that you know comes to mind is intuitive is to just you know run the data so you can just look at it. But um, and in our studio, if you if you do view and then the data, it will open a new tab for you and um, you can see the data, but still it's not very, like the human eye and human brain can't process that much, that many rows really. So you need another way to like succinctly see the data. And in the Jupyter notebook, actually, I wouldn't recommend just running the whole data set so you can just look at all the rows because it takes memory for the data the, for R or R Studio or Python um, to show you all these roles. And if you have a really large data set, it could really slow down your notebook unnecessarily, or it could even crush it. So instead use other things. You can use head or tail. So head helps you to see the first N rows of the data. So here I'm seeing the first three rows. If you don't specify N, the default is six. So tail is the same thing, except it lets you see the last n rows. So here we're seeing the last six rows of the data set. Um, and glimpse, so I'm using our cancer DF that we queried earlier, helps you to see a compact display of the structure of the data. So here uh, it's showing me um, the column names, the number of rows, number of columns, the column data types, which is important when we're wrangling, and also sample values that are within each column. Dimension shows you the number of rows and number of columns in the data frame. Unique um, helps you to see the unique value in the column. So in R, to get the name of a column, you just type the data frame name, you use a dollar sign, and then the name of the column. So here, we're seeing the unique values within um, the cancer data frame columns. And why do we need to see the unique values? Well, you know, AOU data is long format, which means a person will have multiple rows of data, each row representing an event. So think of a person um, going to the doctor multiple times, each event will have its own timestamp and will be its own rows. Um, people take multiple surveys or answer multiple questions or have multiple answers to a specific questions. All of that will be captured in a long format. So the number of rows is not necessarily matched the number of unique instances of a condition occurrence, for example. So unique helps you to see, instead of seeing all the rows, see only the unique values in there. Um, we have another one. Let me Put this up a little bit. Okay, now we have n distinct, which you're probably going to use a lot. Helps you to see the unique, the count of unique values in the column. So here, n distinct is helping us to see the count of unique person in um, our visit data frame. And we have about 12,000 people, but we do have, so dimension here shows us that we have 20,000 rows, again, because one person has multiple rows. Summarize and summarize all. Um, apply a summary function to a column or to an entire data frame, right? So here, I am applying the end distinct function to the question column from the basics data frame. And I'm renaming the new column that contains the counts as n questions. So we have five unique questions in this data frame. Now, if you want to apply a function, it can be any function, it can be mean, it can be max, anything, to um, an entire data frame, you just do summarize all, you apply the function to the entire, to every column in the data frame. So here, this is the result that we get, okay? So that is for the data understanding. You can do a lot more, um, but these are some of the basics. Now, the next thing is data wrinkling, which is probably going to be the most time consuming. Um, so in data wrinkling, you can do multiple things. So we're gonna do subsetting data, grouping data, reshaping data, and merging data. And by the way, um, in um, RStudio or in Python, you can see 
in RStudio or in Jupyter Notebook, you can see an outline of your code or your markdown, which is really nice. So here I click outline and I can just move in between um, my titles without having to scroll in down and up endlessly. Okay, so we're in subsetting data. So this means filtering rows or selecting columns. So let's say um, I want to get data um, for visits on or after 2003, right? So let's look at our visit data frame again, um, just so we remember sorry, what it looks like. And let's look at the first two rows. Um, you can also click on Control Enter to run a cell, to run a line of code within a code chunk. And to add another code chunk, you can just type it the way it is, or you can copy paste, or you can click here plus R, and then you can add another code chunk just to make sure there is a space in between them. So anything between the three backslashes and with the cur the R within curly brackets. Say it tells the markdown notebook this is code, this is our code, this isn't just a text. Okay, so we are seeing the first two rows of our visit data frame. So we want to get data for visits on or after 2023. So we can just do filter um, and put the name of our data frame, which is visits data frame. And then we want the visit start time. If it is start daytime to be um, on or after 2023, 2003, so January 1st, 2003, and then we can run this. And this is what we get. Now, so far, we've only we're only seeing the rows. We haven't saved the new filter data from anywhere. In order to do that, we need to actually assign it, assign it to something. So visit, let's say, let's call it 2003 and after. And then um, now if we run this. You can see that now it appears here. That means we have actually saved it in an object that we can use later. Um, so, so that is it. So you can do multiple things. You can add multiple conditions to filter. So here I have an example for you where um, I not only chose the visits after 2003, but also for a specific person. And notice that for person ID, I put a double equals. Um, so if it's not you know, more equals, less than equals or more equals than something, you have to use double equals. And then if it's a um, integer character, an, an integer column, you have to just, you can just type the integer, but if it's a string, you have to use the quotes so that it doesn't return an error. So. This is another example where I'm selecting any visits on or after 2003 for only outpatient visits. So filter helps you to select rows. Now select helps you to um, select columns. And so now we're going vertically. And by the way, all that I'm doing, all of these things comes from only one package. It is a tidyverse package. If you're new and you wish to back to R, I mean, there's a lot of packages out there and it can be very confusing. Um, for data wrangling, really the only package that you need to know and master and not even everything in it, but just tidyverse, focus on that. So that's what we're using. And then we use big R query earlier to be able to read our data frames into R. And then we're going to use ggplot later for, for, um, for plus. So the only three packages that we're fo focusing on today are tidyverse, big R query, and ggplot, okay? So let's go back to our um, subsetting. So for the columns, it's the same concept. Let's say we wanna get a data frame containing only the person ID from the Fitbit data, all right? So let's look at our Fitbit data frame again. And so we remember the column names and we want to only select the person. So let's call it Fitbit person. 
And um, so we do select our Fitbit data frame, um, and then we want to select only the person ID column. And that is it. And then we run this and this appears here and let's, let's look at it. So now we only have the person ID. Tidyverse makes it really easy. You can do that. And if you want to select multiple columns, you can just list them and separate them by a comma. You can put them in a list. So C in R means list and so on and so forth. So here I'm selecting the person ID and the date. And here I'm doing the same thing, just putting in a list. You can use quote, quotation marks or not when it comes to columns. Um, and yeah, it's, it's really very intuitive. Now, grouping data is 100%. You're going to need to know that. Um, and here I'm just going to try and get um, the count of the, the number of unique participants per question and answer in the basic survey. And I want to do that only for insurance and question surveys. So what I did here, I just want to see what are the question concept ID corresponding to each of the questions. So I just um, selected from the basic survey only the question and concept ID. And I apply the unique here so that it doesn't show me all the rules, but only the unique values so that I can use this in my next code, right? So you could use the string value, the character value to filter, but in general, it's faster to join or filter with integers rather than string. If you must, then you can use strings. Um, so again, this is the first two rows of our basic data frame and let's try and count it. So we're gonna call it survey counts. Now, we're going to use something called um, pipes. So pipes are a way to chain multiple operations together in a concise way. So let's say here, I wanted to, um, for example, I wanted to filter all the visits on or before after 2023 and then select only the person ID column. So I would have to get my data frame for the filter and then use that filter data frame to get now the, to select now the personality column. Where with pipe, you don't have to do this in multiple steps. You can do it all in one code. So I'm going to show you how pipe works, right? So the first thing we want to do is to put the data frame that you want. So we want the basics, DF, right? And then we can use the pipe sign. So there are two pipe signs. You can use this one or you can use that one. Those are the same thing. And then next, I'm going to actually filter um, because I want to select only a couple of questions. Remember, employment and insurance. So I'm going to filter question. I could do question equals this or question equals that, or I could just do question in and then use the list sign to select insurance. And employment, right? And I'm going to show you what it looks like before we move on. Let's see, let me run everything. Um, oops. Oh, question concept ID, not question. There you go. There you go. So you can see um, that it returning only those two questions. Now, next, I'm going to remove the question concept ID column because I don't, I don't really need it anymore. So I'm going to do the pipe. And then I'm going to use what? Select, because we want to work with columns. Now, up until now, I'll show you how to keep the columns that you want. But sometimes it's easier to just remove the column that you don't want. Since we only want to remove one, we can just do that. And you, in Taivas, you just do minus question concept ID. It's that simple. Um, and then let's run this. And now we have only three columns. Okay, now we want to um, count the unique person per question and answer, right? So again, we're gonna add the pipe. You can do it all in one line. You don't have to go to the next line. It's just prettier that way, but just make sure to keep the pipe at the end of every line. Um, 
So now we're going to do group by, question, answer. And if I just run it, nothing will happen because I actually have not applied any summary function to anything. I want the count of unique participants. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna apply the end distinct function to the person ID column. So summarize, we saw that earlier. And then we're gonna call the new column NPIDs. So end distinct um, person ID. And then now we're gonna get the counts. So I did all of that in one code and notice I only had to enter the name of the data frame once instead of entering within the function every time. This is what the pipe does. It's saying, hey, apply all this code to these basics in that order. And this is how, this is another example here. I did some counts with the Fitbit data frame. Um, here I'm counting, I'm applying the summary function to multiple columns at once and applying different function. I'm applying the max here to get the latest state, the mean of the heart rate and calories. Um, and I'm doing this, I'm grouping this by zone name. So you can do a lot of these. And if you Google um, tidyverse, tidyverse cheat sheet, you, it will give you like assistant one or two pages of methods and function to do all of that. And we also have a wonderful library of featured workspaces that show you some of these operations. Okay, next, reshaping data. Like I mentioned earlier, all of us data is long format. So most, a lot of researchers want to change this data to wide format, meaning they want one person one row per person. So let's say we have a survey, right? And we want, so this is an example of, of this. I'm showing you the first five rows of this data set um, and I'm sorting it by person ID. So you can see that this person has multiple rows because this is multiple um, questions, right? So how do we change it so that one person has one row? We're going to use the tidyverse method pivot wider. And um, so let's see, let's name it survey of basics wider. Basics wider. And then we can pivot wider. We could also use a pipe here, but we're just gonna use that, um, the normal operation, pivot wider, the basics DF. Um, and then, so R is showing you, you know, some of the arguments, but if you just, you can just Google on the cheat sheet also, it will tell you like, what are the arguments, but names from is asking you, what is the column that you want to be the new column? So, right. So what I'm saying here is I want the question, the values within the question columns to be the new column in my wider data frame. And then values from is asking what, um, what columns do you want to be the new value? So I'm saying I want answer to be the new cell values of my wider data frame, okay? So we can just run this. Um, actually, let me remove the question concept ID real quick. So select minus question. Concept ID. Um, yes, it should work. And it's really hard to see here, but I'm going to show you in the view pane. So now we have um, a nice wide data frame. And notice we have 2,034, um, 234,000 rows. Well, let's see. If you run dimension, we know you see that we have um, number of rows is exactly equal to the number of unique participants. That means we have one row per person. So our wider um, function worked. Um, and here I'm doing the same thing with um, physical measurement data. I'm doing a little more something a little more complicated here. I'm basically combining um, this column and this column with the end. So I'm saying 
heart rate mean in whatever unit that is, um, and then so on and so forth. Um, and I'm removing the visit occurrence ID column, and I'm grouping by and doing the means and then pivoting wider. So this is the result of this operation. I think I ran it. No, I haven't run it before. Um, yeah, it's a nice data frame that gives me, you know, per physical measurement, this is the average value per person per day. And you can see that I put the, um, the measurement and the unit together. So it's easy to read. So there's a lot you can do um, with pivot wider. Okay, now merging and joining data is another big one. Um, I created a few sample tables um, so that it's easier for us to see the before and after. So let's see um, our before. So DFD1, DF is, DF1 is um, from our cancer data frame. Um, I'm selecting only the person ID and the standard concept name and only certain person IDs here. And then DF2 is our Fitbit data. Um, now, inner join. This is probably the most common type of, it is the most common type of join that you will do. Um, it's when you join to data frame and it retains only the matching rows in both data frame. So <clears throat> let's run this. So we're in a joining DF1 and DF2. So it's keeping only the, the, the matching rows on a specific column on person ID. So in our code, I didn't specify which, I could do on um, equals person ID, but I didn't do that. And what inner join does, it, it will find, you know, it will look at the data frame and find the common column and merge by that. So it's telling you didn't give me anything. So I'm going to join by person ID, which is what we want. Um, and so it's gonna look at if there is any matching person ID between those two, it's going to get the corresponding rows from each of the data frame and put it together and stack the columns side by side. So this is what we get here with the inner join. So like, if you think of um, a Venn diagram, it's the part that, um, that both of the intersection parts, right? And then now full join, it joins the data from both data frame, retains all the value. It doesn't matter if there's a match or not. And what happens is, when there's no match. So here, for example, these people have data in the cancer data frame, but nothing in the um, Fitbit. So it will fill in what's not, what doesn't match with NAs. In the same way, if there's somebody that has data here in the Fitbit, but not in the cancer, it will fill in what doesn't match with NAs. And then whatever match, it's going to be there as well. So it's both data from together, whether it's matches, there are matches or not. So that's a full join. Now the right join, it'll, it'll return, return all the records from the right table. So this table here, and the, only the matching records from the left table. So let's look at it. So right join, right? So basically it returns all the records from the Fitbit table, whether they match the um, cancer data frame or not. And then only, um, sorry, I think the opposite. It returns all the matches from the, yeah, from the Fitbit table, whether they match or not, and then only the matching record from the other side. Now, the um, left join, it's the opposite. So it returns all the record from the, the yeah, the left table, which is the F1, and only the match the matching record from the right table, which is the F2, right? So all the records from the left table, and then only the matching records. And what does it what does it match will be fill in with any once again. Okay, now enter join is an interesting one. It's basically kind of the opposite of an inner join. So anti-join returns the row from the first data frame here that do not have a match in a in the, the second data frame. 
So let's run entire join and see. So this is all, those are all the rows in the um, cancer data frame that do not have a match in the Fitbit data frame. So if you do the opposite and then you put DF2 here, so that will give you all the rows in the Fitbit data frame that do not have a match in the cancer data frame. Okay, so we've covered a lot so far. Um, we've covered um, subsetting data for, for rows use filter, for columns use select. We've covered grouping data. You just remember um, group by and summarize um, are gonna be your friends. And then you can use pipes to chain multiple operations together. You do not have to. Um, and then we've covered joining data, um, we cover inner join, which retains the matching rows, um, a full join, all the rows, right joins, left join, and then anti join. Now, these are the main operations that you will need for data wrangling. Um, now we're going to look at some um, visualization real quick. Um, ggplot is the standard package for visualizing in R. Um, if you use R, you probably know this. It has basically everything that you need. I, I can remember only a couple instances where I couldn't use ggplot. Um, so he, here I'm just showing you a simple histogram on the value and as numbers from the physical measurement data. Um, so the basic syntax is this, ggplot, uh, you put the columns that you want to plot within the um, the map um, function, and then you add whatever plot you want. You want a histogram, you want a bar plot, you want a um, dot plot, you want a line plot, you can do that. Uh, of course, the syntax is going to change a little bit. The mapping here is going to change based on the type of graphs that you're doing. But again, ggplot also has a very good cheat sheet that you can look up. And also in our featured workspaces, we have plus examples for you there. Now, this is another one where you, you can keep adding, you know, um, arguments to change the colors, the access, to add legends. Here, I'm just adding color and I'm just changing the x-axis size and I'm adding um, a figure size also. So this is a bar plot of the age demographics that I got from the pressure table. Um, so yeah, you, this is for ggplot. Now, yes, we do have a little bit of time. And let me talk about saving your results to bucket and why you want to use the bucket. So when you save, um, when you run your analysis, and you get to a stopping point, we recommend that you save whatever result that you have in the bucket so that the next time you come, you don't have to run the whole notebook again. You can just start where you stopped. And in order to do that, you can save it in a persistent disk or the bucket. Well, the persistent disk basically in our studio, you can see it here. So if I do, let's add another chunk real quick. Um, if I do write CSV, and let's say I'm going to write our anti-join data frame to, um, and let me call it anti-join CSV. Right, it, it appears here. That means I've saved it in my environment, in my persistence. This is the default storage. But if you delete your persistent disk, this will also go. And this will cost you about $4 a month to keep this in storage. So that's why we prefer, if you have files that you want to save permanently, save it to the bucket, because once it's in the bucket, it's not gonna go away, even if you delete your persistent disk. Um, and it costs about, it costs a few cents a month to keep this in storage, right? So. But in order for you to save to the bucket, it has to go first here. Um, and then also something we recommend, I think Brady mentioned that, is that if you are not using your persistent disk or you're done for the day, you can either pause it, or if you're not gonna open your notebook or workspace for a while, you can just delete the persistent disk 
it won't delete the files that are in the bucket. Also, your notebooks are automatically saved in the bucket. So even if you delete the persistent disk, it's not going to save to delete the, the notebooks. So these snippets, I got them from the R notebook. Um, so if you go to any R notebook and you click snippet, and then you click on all of us are sorry, all of us are in cloud storage snippet. Um, and then you go to copy file to or from bucket. And I want to copy data to the workspace bucket. I click here and it'll give me this code. And this is what I just copied and pasted here in our studio. If you know um, GS Util, you can just simply do it. Um, but if you don't know this, just use the snippet. And I'm going to show you what the snippet is doing and how to use it. So all you need to worry about are those two first two lines. So it say replace DF with the name of your data frame. Well, I want to save anti join. So I, I'm going to replace it with anti join. And then I want to name it anti join that CSV, right? Or just anti join to CSV. And that's all. Don't change anything else. And then you can run it. And then, so it saves here and then in the bucket. So this is what it's doing. First, it'll save it to the, to the persistent disk and then save it to the bucket from the persistent disk under a folder named my data. Why? Because um, as of now, the bucket cannot access directly your notebook. It has to go through the persistent disk first. But once that's in the bucket, you can delete that one. And then next time you can read it back from the bucket. So you do the same thing. You, um, and also the last line here is just showing you um, the files that are in that folder so that you can see that your operation works. So we do have this, I said this yesterday, but you do have this under data in the bucket. This is the bucket name um, that is attached to your workspace. And you can share, so when you share the workspace uh, with other people, they can access your bucket, but they cannot access your persistent disk. Okay, now this is to read the file back. So the file that we want to read back is called this. So let's put it here, that CSV. And then um, that's all, you don't change, don't change anything. And again, I copied this from the, um, our notebook snippets, and you can just run. And so what it did is that it grabbed the file from the bucket and read it back in your persistent disk, um, from your persistent disk, and then, yes, it then is showing you, and then you can start working it with it. So if you saved your files in the bucket, the next time you can just save it back from the bucket and then continue working with it without having to run your whole notebook again. So <clears throat> this is what I have for you today and I hope this was helpful. And now um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them. Thank you, Amon, that was amazing. I actually learned a lot watching and I've sat through a lot of these, so great job. Um, well, attendees, we have answered all of the questions I've seen in the chat box and in the Q&A box, but um, now it's an opportunity to ask directly to our subject matter experts on the call. So uh, please continue adding questions in the Q&A and also in the chat. I just want to give quick kudos to Emain too. Um, it, it was really great to watch all of that code and how easily and smoothly you can pull data together. Um, the questions in the in the Q and A have been really good questions. Um, it's great to know that you can combine ClinVar data um, with uh, all of us data. It's really very powerful. Thank you. And I think we can go probably to the last slide and then while we're waiting for questions. Okay. Although we just got a question. So we'll answer this and then if there's no more, we can go to the last slide. Um, <clears throat> so this one says the files in the bucket always need to be copied back to the persistent disk so they can be read. Is that correct, Imon? Yes, it's correct. Um, but the snippet does all that for you. Yes. Great.
And I also want to give a shout out to Sam and Danielle, who have been amazing in answering questions as they come in. All right, folks, we got one more slide for you. Stay on if you're able. Um, and then we will be able to end the webinar if there's no more questions. Great, thank you. So I'm Sydney. You've probably seen me in the chat um, and in the Q&A. I work for the All of Us Research Program in the Division of Engagement and Outreach. And um, I have been working closely with Cindy and Bernadette and the NIH Library Webinar staff to host this webinar series. Um, so hopefully most of you have us from the beginning back in March. But if you haven't, don't fret. We will be sending out the links to the recordings after this session. And this is the uh, second to last webinar in this series. So unfortunately, we are coming to a close next Friday, but same time, same place. Um, so please register for that if you haven't already. This is going to be a great webinar focusing on resources to support researchers. So this is going to include funding opportunities, uh, training classes, upcoming trainings, um, and it'll walk you through the user support hub, which is this amazing um, directory of resources, and it has all sorts of videos and things. So we will cover that next week. And I did see a hand raised. So if you're able to come off mute, go ahead. If not, you can put your question in the Q&A. Uh, Bernadette, was there somebody with their hand raised or was their question answered? It, oh, okay. So Jing Wu has raised their hand. Let's see if I can um, allow them to unmute themselves. Hang on one second. There we go. So if you're still with us, uh, Jing, you should now be able to unmute and ask your question. Sorry, I just uh, mistake. That's my mistakes. Sorry. Oh, that's okay. So you don't have a question? <laughs> no. Okay, no worries. We did get. Oh, I changed your mind. We're good. Alrighty. Well, um, I think we can end early then. You all can get nine minutes back on your Friday. Um, yes. If you have any questions, please reach out, and Cindy, I'll hand it over to you. Okay, terrific. Thank you, Sydney. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, everyone, for coming and attending. Thank you, Amon, for a great presentation. It's really great to see all of that code in action and how you can actually join the data together. That was very valuable. Um, so, yes, if you haven't registered for next week, I Again, you're going to get lots of information about all of us, so I encourage you to do that. And we will send all of the links as soon as possible. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.